Okay, so now we're going to talk about earthquake-induced um, earth pressures against walls. This is probably the, some of the most important papers that you need to read uh, in this uh, earth pressure block, because this is new stuff that's just come out. It's controversial, and it's against a lot of the codes, and you guys are going to be in positions where you're going to be fighting the code guys for some just outrageously high lateral earth pressures for walls that are never going to be there, they're never going to exist, and we're, we're, I'm going to explain to you, I'm at least overview to you now, what the issues are and where the problems are with the current design methods for, earth, for lateral earth pressures for earthquakes, and then you need to go read these papers on this one and be ready to go fight your, uh, your uh, um, jurisdictions approving your designs, because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on now with lateral earth pressures uh, for retaining walls uh, for um, earthquake loadings. Just outrageous stuff. Okay, so um, you need to be able to mo MO. Everybody know the MO method? Some of you do, some of you don't. Mononobe Okobe. You gotta learn to say that fast three times. It really impress the hell out of people. Um, uh, that's the standard design method for lateral earth pressure. In fact, it's specified in all kinds of codes and stuff now. It's crazy, but it's there. Um, so you need. So you need to. Understand the assumptions behind it. It's critical that you understand the assumptions behind that, and you and it, it would even be. I think I found the original Mononobe and Akobe papers and, and uploaded them for you. You should go read those and understand those. And read, uh, how's that? Read something and inwardly digest them. Um, then uh, there's been a lot of really good work uh, done by Marshall Liu, uh, who's at AMEC here in town, and. Um, Who's the guy at uh, um, I can't remember who, the name of the guy who did the centrifuge testing, but we'll see it here in a minute. Um, they've got really good well, they've got a very good both theoretical and uh, and some good uh, centrifuge data refuting a lot of the assumptions that are in the Mononobe Kobe method. They've got much better, more realistic designs for um, uh, design guidelines for uh, uh, walls for earthquake loadings, and um, it's not in codes yet. Uh, I suspect that it'll be, you know, this is the code world, so it'll probably be another five or ten years before it gets in code. So this is stuff that is going to be really important to you when you've got a client that you can actually talk to. Uh, so um, I think it's important that there's no there's no way that you can understand. Um, there, there's going to be many cases where the, where the MO is going to give you just ridiculously conservative numbers, and you need to know how to apply those properly in light of this new data that's coming out from uh, from Lou and others. So let's start off with the MO method. Um, so um, if this is my retaining wall, and there's some earthquake. I've got some um, both. Uh, horizontal and vertical acceleration, those, those, are, those are Gs, so it's K, K is the G factor um, that we get from the earthquake. And, you know, commonly, this is a pseudo-static method, so commonly what we do, and this is like the first way for doing earthquake engineering for slopes or anything, we just say, well, what's the maximum acceleration? And then we just apply that acceleration to the mass that might be moving. In this case, it'll be the mass from the active wedge. We say, okay, well, that's, a, that's a force times a mass. That's, a, or, I'm sorry, a mass times acceleration. That's a force. We're going to apply that force to the to the thing, and just like it was a static force. And hey, what could be worse than that? Um, and so it's a pseudo-static method. It's a very common one. Uh, it's kind of the first uh, approach to earthquake engineering. Uh, so so the MO method is exactly that kind of method. Uh, the analysis based on a Coulomb analysis, so it includes wall friction. Um, uh, the method ignores the vertical component of the uh, earthquake, uh, and then the horizontal component is just the the weight of the of the potential failure mass times the horizontal acceleration. So it's just just F equals M A. That's just M A is all that is. All right. So back in the day, we used to have to derive the M O equations. It's just a it's just a bunch of um, force equilibrium stuff, but these are the forces acting on the wall. You've got you've got the weight of the wedge behind. This is your this is your failure wedge. This is going to be your critical angle, your your critical theta angle. Um, the horizontal force is going to be W times kH, um, and 
this is the equation for the, the force on the wall, and this is the equation for K sub AE, which is the, the, the earthquake-induced lateral pressure. This is really important for you to understand. In the original Mononobio Kobe, that's the entire horizontal force, the static plus the earthquake-induced. You will be amazed how many people will take Ka times, and then they'll calculate the static. Then they'll take Kae from Mononobio Kobe, and they'll calculate that one. They'll add the two together, and they'll say, there, there's the load you need to design for. They have now just double designed for the static earth, lateral earth pressure. Mononobia Kobe directly gives you, it, it, it's a combined, it, it's a pseudo-static method where you put everything in it and then find the critical angle and do it. So it, it includes both the static and the earthquake-induced component. It's critical that you understand that. There are walls built today that didn't under, by people that did not understand that. The good news is they're definitely not falling down. They just cost the client a lot of money, that's all. So that's what this next slide is all about. So I went on my big rant and rave. Now it's in print for you. Um, so PAE and KAE are the total lateral loads from both the static and the seismic forces. So the earthquake component is properly called delta KAE. And you've got to calculate that as a difference between KAE and K-active. And, and it's a, you should use a delta symbol, because then it makes it really clear when you put that, that that's the delta KA due to the earthquake. And, and sometimes in your des designs, you need to separate these two, because you can do a static for this, you can do an earthquake for that. So, when you, so it's important that you do this correctly. Because like if you're using load and resistance factor design, you've got different, or even, even if you're using uh, uh, um, ASD methods, you've got different uh, uh, load combinations for the earthquake versus the static. So you've got to separate it anyway in the design process. We'll talk about that next time. But you've got to separate it, so, it's, so you've got to know the difference between KAE and delta KAE. Because otherwise you're putting really big loads on your wall. From a, from a, from a, a, a theory that's already going to give you loads that are too high. So you don't, you don't need that. Um, so then, the, then the, the, the earthquake-induced load is then obviously just 1 half gamma H times Ka, right? So uh, for typical values uh, that you see in, of, of back slopes and, and friction angles and angles of the wall, just kind of typical values you get, see, and uh, Whitman did this analysis in the 70s, you're going to, I mean, these are just good numbers for you to have when you do the calculations or somebody brings something in. So somebody brings you in a KAE that's bigger than KH, you know they probably forgot to do delta KA versus KE. But generally speaking, delta, oh, what was that? Um, generally speaking, delta KE is about uh, three quarters of KH. Um, and this is a nice, um, why is this doing this? There's what, that's what I want. Thank you. And then this is a nice number to have in the back of your head. Please pin. Thank you. Um, that um, the earthquake-induced lateral force, the total lateral force, is going to be about 3 eighths of the acceleration uh, times the height of the wall squared. That's just a, so these are nice numbers to have in the back of your pocket, so when you're checking stuff or you got to do something quickly that you can use. Uh, and just go look, at, uh, go look at this paper if you want to know the background to that. Um, this is the, uh, Wood um, did a recommendation for non-yielding walls for, for like if you're doing designs against really stiff walls. All, this, this all stuff, all, stuff's all done for yielding walls. Uh, uh, Wood, Wood looked at the culvert problem where you got a culvert and, the, and you got the earthquake coming through and, the, and you got soil moving on both sides of the culvert. You got a really rigid thing. What are the earth, you know, what kind of, any kind of buried structure? What, what are the lateral earth pressures you should use on buried structures with the rigid? And, uh, and this was his recommendation. So you can see that's quite a bit higher than, than, uh, than you would get um, from a, for, for a yielding wall. And if you do need to worry about those rigid ones, I would go read Wood's paper, although there's still some problems with it. So that's to get you 
don't, so, the, so the story is, don't confuse PAE with delta PAE. Don't confuse KAE with delta KAE. Um, and these, these are good ballpark numbers for you to be, to be using. Hmm. Why is there ink on this slide? Let me try this and see if it works. Okay, now here's another great controversy that's very confusing. Where is the location of that dynamic earth pressure force that you're calculating? Well, it's not discussed at all in Mononobia. Uh, uh, the, there's the mononobe Kobe method is um, comes from. Mononobe and Matsuo's paper plus Akobe's method, and, and this is the later of the papers, I think that's right. But let's just think about it for a minute. Here's my wall. Here's my failure wedge. Where do you think it should act? Well, what's the, where's the centroid of your triangle, if it's a triangle? Yeah, so I mean, you know, so the centroid of the triangle is right here. If it's really, if it's really a, 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 a an acceleration times that mass, it you know it should act at the upper third point, right? Uh, well, first of all, it's not when somebody tells you where where the MO method says it should be, you can tell them the MO method doesn't tell you where it should be because it, it's not in the paper. It says nothing about the location of, of the. Okay, um, a Coulomb analysis would put it uh, uh, one third up from the base if you did the Coulomb analysis. Um, these here's some other suggestions that have been made: two thirds up the base, uh, and this is the one that everybody. The, the, this is the one that people think that they. This is the one that people use a lot. There's there's a this. I think this is the paper that said yeah the distribution of the of the um, of the horizontal earth pressure from a uh, of, of the uh, PAE is an inverted triangle, just the opposite of, of the static earth pressure. So that, uh, that was, there's one suggestion. That was made in 1969. And Whitman uh, said it should be 0.6 up from the base in 1990. Um, Lamb and Martin said it should be halfway up the base in 1986. Um, and none of that is comes from any kind of measured data. The only measured sitar, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, the only measured data for earthquake loads on walls that we know of comes from the centrifuge tests. Well, except for Monono Biakobi, which did it. Well, I'll, I'll show you how, how, how they ran their test. Now, um, the only way you can, the only way uh, that you can get um, full scale information about soil structure interaction at a small scale is to a centrifuge test. I'm not, I don't want to get into, uh, into modeling here, but you can't, you can't do, we can't do a tabletop test in a little sandbox here and extrapolate that up to full scale because things don't scale that way because you got one G here in this, it just, nothing scales that way. The only way you can do this right is to do centrifuge testing, which is why there's all this centrifuge testing going on in geotechnical engineering. So the first centrifuge testing that was ever done with this uh, was done by uh, Al Sitar and, and Al Atik, um, and this is the this is the stuff that Lou used. In fact, his paper is Lou and Sitar. So um, their preliminary data from their centrifuge test indicates that the centroid of that earthquake load is probably a third up from the base. Um, so I think the answer is, I didn't mean to go through that fast, sorry. I think this is the answer. OK, I think that's the right answer that you need to be using. It's, it's, it's actually pretty complicated because the wall and the earth don't necessarily move. That's the other thing you get from looking at the sitar's data. The wall and the earth don't move together. You know, they, they actually kind of go back and forth and smack each other and all, do all kinds of crazy things if you, do, you look at any dynamics. So, so this whole idea that, the, that, that that soil is moving and pushes the wall, they don't move together. So 
Uh, but I think when you're doing this, then this is important because, are right, you structural engineers, why should we care where the load's uh, located on the wall? It's all the same force. I'm designing a cantilevered retaining wall. Why do I care where the earthquake resultant load is? Yeah, you, you, you're going to get a hell of a lot bigger moment if it's at the upper third point than if it's at the lower third point, right? So this is really important. So I think this is the right answer. Um, so uh, a the appropriate values of KH to use. Um, so, um, so those of you who are not no familiarity whatsoever with geotechnical earthquake engineering, too bad you're going to have to bear through this and figure it out later. Um, I'm not doing the earthquake engineering class. That's taught next quarter. I think that's right. Isn't it next quarter? I think that's right. And you can ask uh, um, um, uh, Dr. Chowdhury about it then. OK, so um, using KH equal to the, the, the peak ground acceleration is definitely conservative for any kind of a yielding structure. That's for sure. You definitely, going in there with a PGA as your horizontal acceleration is definitely more than you're going to need. Uh, if you've got a small structure and it doesn't matter, great. Then you can't, you can't possibly go wrong with that, but it's really high. Uh, common practice is to use about half of the PGA. So PGA is peak ground acceleration, for those of you who don't know. Um, that still is probably conservative. Read Lou et al. 2010. Is that message clear yet? Got to read that paper. Um, for non-yielding walls, um, the, the FEMA 450, which, which is going to control some of these designs that you guys have to deal with, Recommends using Mononobu Kobe as a lower bound, and the wood, which is the the one which that were they use a full one G, the, the full acceleration value as an upper bound. So this is disturbing, <laughs> um, and, and it clearly it's possible to get higher loads in non-yielding walls than yielding walls. But still, this is even even uh, th these numbers are, are really high. Um, whoops, page up. Um, so using so if that's the case, then you definitely don't want to use the PGA for your KH, because that's already conservative. So I, I, I wrote ultra conservative there, but but using um, um, that, that wood paper is it's, there's nothing wrong with the paper, but it's but it's way out of date now. Um, but as far as I know, that's the only thing that's the only thing I've seen out there uh, for loads on um, rigid. Uh, non-yielding walls for dynamic loads on non-yielding walls. Okay. So now let's talk about cohesive backfill for a minute. So MO um, and wood were both derived strictly for cohesionless soils. The whole analysis was for cohesionless soils. Well, if the soil is stronger, you're going to get lower lateral loads. And particularly, even, even in cases where we might want to say, well, this is apparent cohesion for the long-term analysis, I'm going to ignore it. For the dynamic analysis, that cohesion might really be there and really be helpful to you. So um, there has been some work done on this. Um, and it's very clear that, 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 that if you have any significant cohesion, you can dramatically reduce the uh, lateral earth pressure coefficients from uh, due to earthquakes. Uh, and there are some design guidelines, and I would commend to you particular Anderson at all. It's a FHWA uh, publication, um, and we'll show you some of their uh, recommendations here. In fact, I think they're right here right now. So these are, and I'll I just put this here to show you what's going on. These are the. Why do I have that? Mm, oh well. So here's the the. Um, Earth pressure coefficients recommended for different cohesion values. So these are the dimensional. This is a dimensional slate to deal with cohesion. It's the cohesion divided by gamma times the height of the wall. So we're going from zero here to very high cohesion here. And look how much for a given. Let's say. Let's say we got you're at a four tenths of a g. You know. Look how much you're reduce, reducing your lateral earth pressure uh, due to cohesion. So, um, if you're if you're in this game with regulators and um, you can't 
get them to back off MO for you, then you need to at least use all the other weapons in your uh, arsenal to try and get down to a design earth pressure that's reasonable. And one of them you can do is by, if there's any cohesion, and you can, you can grab that and do it. I'll give you a little summary about that in a minute, what I think my approach might be. Um, so why, what's all this problem with, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but, but in some cases, like for instance, if it's, a, if it's a basement wall, you might not. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if, I mean, if it's, if it's a built wall, you're not going to you, 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 put a cohesive soil back there just to reduce the earth pressure, the, 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 uh, the earth pressure for um, our earthquakes. But, but if you've got a slurry wall or something that's, then it's now a basement wall, there's a lot of cases where you have basement walls that have cohesive soils behind them. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, don't go putting a cohesive soil behind your wall just so the... So the earthquake uh, pressures are lower. That's not a good reason to do it. But if it's there, you can take advantage of that, that uh, decrease in the uh, dynamic earth pressure. Good question. Jack, he scores one today. You're minus one. So Omid's up. Um, OK, well, the first problem is, is that this is a static approach to a dynamic problem. Uh, and one, like I said, one of the best, like as I said earlier, one of the best findings out of out of um, the um, centrifuge testing that that Sitar did was that the wall and the back soil don't move together, which there's no, if you think about it, there's no reason they should. They're going to be accelerated differently. One's going to get, you know, acceleration from the base, and the other one's going to get the acceleration. So there's no reason they should be moving together. It's a much more complicated problem than that. Um, so. The test, uh, the, the Mononobio, te, Mononobio Kobe test, I'll show you a picture in just a second. They were done, there, this is a thing about the size of this table. That's what they were using to test it. And it was done at 1G. And when you do 1G stuff, it doesn't scale. It just plain doesn't scale. You, you, can't use, you can't do a 1G test for a small thing and scale it up. It just doesn't work. You have to, you have to use um, um, centrifuge testing. Uh, their motions that they input there weren't anything like earthquake motions. They were sinusoidal. So they weren't anything like an earthquake motion. Um, and the wall boundary conditions, uh, the, the wall was allowed to rotate but not translate. So the wall was pinned on one end. It was only allowed to rotate. Um, and if, if it's to, Remember that our earth pressures are controlled by displacement. In other words, once we get to, once we get to a certain displacement, the soil is going to fail, you know, and, and we get to the active condition. That's going to—it's it's a displacement that's going to control the earth pressures. It's not really the acceleration that's controlling the earth pressures. So, basing all of your loads based on acceleration doesn't make a whole lot of sense anyway. They probably ought to be based on the displacement that you're expecting to get. Uh, so the, the whole PGA thing is probably excessively conservative. So here's, this is um, from uh, Mononobe and Matsu's original. This, this, this is the original. So this is before Okobe came in to help to, to, to write the equations. But this is their box. And I believe these are in, in English units. It was four feet high and nine feet long. Right? So it's you know, twice as long as this. Um, and they drove it by, I mean, this is pretty, look, this is 1926. This, is, this was awesome in 1926. It's almost 100, we're, we're getting near 100 years ago. You think we might have learned something in that time. And it, it was actually pretty, pretty ingenious. Um, so they, they built this thing, whoops, well, that's good. We'll do it this way. This thing was built, put on rockers. And then they had this, I love this, the way they got the, uh, the sinusoid action. They hooked it up to a winch. And they, they, the cable off the winch, they put on this conical drum. So as they, as they pull the winch, which is going to go at a constant RPM or constant velocity, you're actually going to increase the uh, frequency of this little device. And, and this is a, a, attached to a cam. So, so, so this thing goes back and forth. So it starts off slow and goes faster and faster and faster. I mean, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how many graduate students they got to do this for them. But, it was pre but, but you know, it's pretty. You know, it's a pretty brilliant design for 1926. And then um, they actually had walls on both sides then. And there's a hinge here. 
So the wall can only rotate, um, rotate like this, right? They don't, they don't translate. They can only rotate. And then they had, um, this is a pressure, uh, they had a little force transducers. What this really is, this is a pressure gauge, but it's really a force transducer they use to measure the, to measure the loads. That's, that's it. That's, that's what all this stuff is based on. Um, so if that is, so the next question is, well, if that stuff's so old, I had 50 plus years, I need to update that. Um, you know, why are we using this thing 80, 90, almost 90 years later, right? I mean, we've updated a few other things in the last 90 years. Why haven't we updated our understanding of lateral earth pressures during earthquakes? And that's, that's a good question to ask. Um, whoops. I thought I had some answers here. Oh, no, this is the answer. OK, sorry. Well, um, you know, what were we using for ground accelerations uh, 20 years ago? I mean, people said, oh, you can't get over half a G in an earthquake. Right? We had relatively low uh, ground accelerations that we were working. This never drove the problem. You know, this never uh, was part of what controlled the, the design. You'd put your lateral earth pressure, you'd put your KA in there from this, and it was like, yeah, fine, we don't care, move on. And so as long as it didn't drive the problem, it didn't matter. Well, now we've got, anybody, what, what's the, for, for, if you do an LRFD design, what's the load, uh, what's the load factor for uh, um, soil loads, you structural engineers? What's the, what's the, the st what's this in the, in the 1.6, right? What were we using a while ago? One. So now you've taken a load that was already too high. Now you multiply by 1.6, and all of a sudden this is starting to drive designs. So really, the, the, the I mean, nobody could get any work to, to look at what the lateral earthquake coefficient should be for, for walls, um, but, the, but um, until until you know in the last decade, because it, who cares? It just, I just need something to check to make sure the wall's not going to fall over during the earthquake, and, they, and it never is controlled. Um, um, Marshall Liu swears that he's never seen a, a uh, retaining wall that's failed in an earthquake due to the loads. There's plenty that have failed because there's been liquefaction, or there's been a, a slide behind him, or something like that. But the wall itself, there, there, he, he says there's not a single example that he's ever seen of a retaining wall or a basement wall that's ever failed in an earthquake. Even, even in Quito, is it not, not Quito, in, uh, um, yeah, Ecuador, is that the, no, not Ecuador. Uh, hmm? Chile, thank you. Not in Chile, not in Haiti, not in Italy, not in Japan. Never seen one. So let's see, where am I at? So I, I'd like to go over what. Uh, um, so Marshall Liu um, doesn't write codes, doesn't get involved with that. Um, but he's provided what he calls some interim guidance for what to do. So it, it's worth going over. Um, so these are provisions that he says for basement walls. So these are walls that are non yielding. He says if, uh, if they're less than 12 feet high, um, ignore earthquake loads if the, fact, if the uh, static factor of safety is 1.5. Don't even worry about it. Um, if the PGE is less than 0.4G, don't worry about it. Um, um, when you're going to add KE, realize that the Mononobia Kobe thing came from uh, act. That, re remember that the, the the total PAE included. I'm, I'm going to sneeze here in a second. Um, in, included um, active conditions plus the earthquake. Right. 
So don't take, so, and, and, and you're going to design, but you're going to design your um, um, basement walls for K naught. But when you do the earthquake uh, tecton, don't take KAE and add it to the K naught. Take KAE and add it to the active conditions, because that's how Mononobia Kobe was developed, and then use that as your dynamic load. Because K naught's already how much bigger than KAE? What's K naught for 30 for 30 degrees? So one minus sine 30. 0.5, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And versus one third, right? So, so don't take don't take that increment and add it to your K naught conditions. Go back to add it to your active conditions because that's the way it was derived in the first place. Um, the the NCHRP, that's the reference I gave you. If, if you have cohesive backfills, use the guidance. It's there. It's published. NCHRP, that's the National Highway National Critical Highway Infrastructure Program. I, I don't remember. That's, F, that's an FHWA pr uh, proposal. So if you have, if and this is a lots of times in basement walls, you will have cohesive soils back there. So that's fine. Um, put the resultant at the lower third, um, and then he's got a chart you can use for cohesionless backfills. I think I might have that one here. Uh, and he says uh, almost all those apply to uh, yielding walls too. When the last time I heard Marshall present, he, we had, he hadn't talked about yielding walls. He was big on the basement walls at the time. Here's the figure nine from Lou uh, et al. And so here's the recommendations. Let's look at this real quickly. Here's delta KAE, all right? So this is the additional earth pressure due to uh, earthquake loading. This and this, this is your PGA. Um, this is, and, and the, the, the points here are data from uh, SITAR's um, centrifuge tests. So these, these are real data from, model, from, from good model tests. Okay, so the, 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 black the, dark, the solid line is for flexible walls, and the dashed line is for, um, he called them stiff oil, but non-yielding walls. And so here's 0.4 G, right? So if you're below 0.4 G, there was no dynamic increment to the, in the model test. There was no dynamic increment to the earth pressures. And above 4 G, he gives you the fit lines there to use. Um, 